Hello, and welcome to Harmony United Methodist Church for our worship time, our virtual online service for the weekend of June the 28th. I thank you for joining us this time, and I invite you to have a heart prepared for worship and praise as we are gathering during this time virtually. My name is Jeffrey Zalatoris, and I'm the pastor here at Harmony Church. With me today are Elaine Stuckey, Matt Cole, and David Elliott. And we are offering these online worship services throughout our summer in the, uh, using Facebook and YouTube. As well, we're going to be offering limited attendance worship within the sanctuary on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock or until otherwise notified. So you can continue to join us either online or coming to the church for worship. And we invite you to pay attention to the church's Facebook and website postings where we will make all of our updates first. I also want to invite you to our Wednesday evening prayer and study gatherings. These are continuing through this week, July the 1st, where we are offering a time here in the sanctuary and also connecting through a Zoom conference service, and that is at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. The following two Wednesdays, we will not hold that Wednesday evening gathering, but we'll pick it up again on the 22nd of July. So if you have any prayers or concerns during the time of our worship, I invite you to share them during the premiere that we offer of this during the, the Facebook time on Sunday mornings. And I have one final announcement to share with you today that it is difficult for us to announce this, but our Director of Ministry for Youth and Children, Terry Hosier, she and her family will be moving on to new adventures. Uh, her husband, Scott, received a job promotion that is moving the family from here to Indiana. So we wish them the very best. We pray God to be with them on their journey with their family. And we invite you as a church that if you'd like to share in a time to wish Terry and her family a goodbye, that next Sunday, July the 5th at 1130, we'll have a casual time to wish her well in the pavilion behind the church. So with that, for this week, we prepare our hearts for a time of worship with music.
Uh, welcome to Harmony United Methodist Church's uh, virtual service. I'm the virtual actual Matt Cole. So uh, we'll have our call to worship now. And that should be found on your screen, I think. So those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. They cannot be moved, but abide forever. As the mountains surrounding Jerusalem protect Zion, so the Lord surrounds the people from this time on and forevermore. Keep the scepter of wickedness from the righteous, O God, so that the righteous are not tempted to do wrong. God's, God's goodness, goodness abides in those who do good, and God is, is good to those, to those who are upright in their hearts. Amen. Amen. Testament reading this morning comes from uh, the very first book, uh, Genesis chapter 22, uh, verses 1 through 14. 
Now after these things, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, that place, the Lord will provide. And as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Thanks be to God. today is from the letter of James, reading out of chapter 2, verses 18 through 26. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I, by my works, will show you my faith. You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you senseless person, that faith apart from works is barren? 
Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was brought to completion by the works. Thus the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One day, in the land of Moriah, a ram with great curled horns grazed alone at the foot of the mountain. He was a strong and noble ram, the leader of his herd. And as he was pulling at some choice tufts of grass, God called to him, saying, Ram? And the ram answered, Here I am. God spoke to the ram. At the top of this mountain, near where a man and a boy are beginning to build an altar, there are some bushes. I want you to climb up there now and catch your horns in the bushes. The ram laughed, saying, God, I've roamed these hills all my life. I know every rock, every crevice, every bush for miles around. Asking me to catch my horns in a thicket is like asking a, a fish to drown or a bird to forget how to fly. But God said, this is important. I need your help right away. Curious now, the ram asked God what the problem was. And God said, I have asked the man Abraham to prove his faith by offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice. But the boy must not be harmed. That is not what I intended. Isaac must live. It is important for all humankind. I need you to be the sacrifice in his place. So begins a story written by Peter Lovenheim, who is an author who likes to imagine biblical stories being told from new and different perspectives. He writes a type of story that's called Midrash, which is a, a story where you reimagine the way that a, the Bible stories were told, and you bring in new perspectives to those stories. And the form of storytelling called Midrash has a long history in Judaism as a, as a way to dive deeper into the stories, into the scriptures, to help us understand more of the meanings behind the scripture. The act of Midrash and looking at stories from different angles is a good lesson for us today, not only as we look at different perspectives of scriptures, but should be how we also spend time looking at different perspectives of even last week's headlines in the news. So obviously, the story that I began telling here, a story about God and a ram, it's, it's a fanciful telling of the story of Abraham's faith. This is a story that even when we read in the New Testament letter from James, that James teaches this story of Abraham and Isaac as the example of faith. But of course, this Genesis story teaches us a bit about Abraham's faith. But I think if we also dig deeper into the story, we see the faith of others in it as well. This passage we read from Genesis goes by the name of the binding of Isaac. And James upholds this very story as the prototype of faith, the faith that's apparent in Abraham's obedience and in Abraham's actions. And here in the story, we first encountered faith when Abraham was listening to God's calling, and Abraham responded with those words, Here I am. 
spoken to God those words, here I am, for Abraham are a confession of his faith, a confession of his faith before the God he has trusted for decades. Abraham acknowledged God's voice. Now it is possible for a person to say and proclaim, I have faith, yet still ignore the voice of God speaking. Yet the person who claims but faith but ignores God's voice actually has no faith. For to ignore God's voice and to choose to not to acknowledge God is to deny one's faith. For if one were to proclaim faith on a Sunday morning, but by Tuesday deny the very voice of God calling one to action, that is a false statement of one's faith. Abraham answered God the first time, Here I am. It was a sign of Abraham's faith, a confession. His words showed his faithfulness by acknowledging God and responding to God. And Abraham's faith then was shown by his actions. Genesis says, Abraham rose early in the morning and set out and went to the place that God had shown him. Abraham's assumed faith was revealed in those words, here I am, and Abraham's assumed faith was revealed as he set out on the journey, taking his son Isaac with him and the two servants, as they went to the place God intended them to go. But Abraham is not the only character in this story, and not the only character behind the story, too. For we know Abraham's history by this point in the book of Genesis. Decades earlier, God had called Abraham and his wife Sarai to go forth from their homeland, to go to a new land. And God had called them repeatedly, time after time, to pick themselves up, to go forth to Egypt, to go forth to Sodom, to go forth to Gerar, to go forth to Beersheba. And each time, Abraham and Sarah, they picked up and they moved obediently and fearfully and faithfully, obeying where God instructed them to go. But in this story, we don't hear about Sarah, but we know Sarah is part of the story. She's behind the story, so to say. That she has the woman who did not have a child for decades, who had given up her hope of having a child, and yet she was promised a great nation. She was also the woman who had followed Abraham through God's faith and her own faith that led them safely on journey after journey. Time and again, Sarah's faith was tested and her endurance was proven. But Sarah was highly protective of this, her only son, Isaac. So how hard must it have been for Sarah to stay left behind to watch her husband and her only son going away without her? Sarah watched her only son going someplace, and for the first time, they were separated. We don't read how she felt, but we know she had such a strong feeling for Isaac and deeply cared for Isaac, she must have carried with her some anxiety and apprehension. Perhaps she even worried every single day a fear waiting until that moment of their return. But we don't hear about Sarah in this particular story. We can't forget her in this story either. That she must have had a faith within her not simply resigning herself that her husband and son would travel and depart, but she had to draw on her faith to endure the time they were gone. She had to draw on her faith to keep herself strong, to let them go, and to be hopeful for their return. But how about Isaac, their son? Isaac also had noticed something strange on their approach to Mount Moriah that he and his father had carried everything they needed to make the offering on the mountain, except the one thing they didn't carry with them was the object of that offering. So Isaac had spoken to his father, who replied the second time in the story, Here I am. 
So just as before, when Abraham replied with faithful attention to God, here I am, again, Abraham replies this time to his son, faithfully, here I am. But also, in that second time, he declares to God, I am paying attention to you. Here I am, I am attentive to you, my God. But can you imagine Abraham's feelings? Abraham had just spent the previous days dreading their arrival at Mount Moriah because he was fearful of doing what God had instructed him to do to his own son. And he and his son and the servants, they had taken three days to reach Mount Moriah, even though the journey could have easily taken less than two. Had Abraham slowed their pace, deliberately taking extra time to give God another chance to speak to him, to give God another chance to change the course that God had laid out before them. It seems that Abraham was hopeful and prayerful that their direction would change from what he was expecting. Still, Abraham had faith in God. His answer, here I am, a confession of his faith in God. The God who had promised that through Isaac a great nation would rise. Yet in Abraham's mind, how would that promise be fulfilled if Abraham were to offer his own son as a sacrifice? The father gave his son a wishful response, a hopeful response. Perhaps it was a prayer. Abraham might have been praying all three days of their journey. God will provide the ram or the lamb. For a burnt offering, my son. Abraham showed faith in God by his prayerful words of hope and by offering his comfort to his son. Abraham's words gave Isaac reason to have faith in his father and faith in God. God will provide the lamb. Abraham spoke. But the story goes on to tell us that God did not provide a lamb, but God instead provided a ram. The sacrifice was not of a child, but of an adult. This story is not so much the story of the sacrifice of Isaac, the child, the lamb, but is the story of the faith offering of Abraham, the adult, a ram. So the ram answered God, here I am. And the ram thought for a moment, and he said, God, you know I would do anything to help you, but I've had plenty of experiences with human beings, and I'm not so sure I want to sacrifice my life for them. We animals do a lot for them, but for the most part, they are selfish and ungrateful. And God answered, I know what you mean. The ram said, for example, my brother, the ox, treads out the corn, but human beings muzzle him so he can't eat even a single mouthful. God said, you are right. I will forbid human beings to muzzle the ox while threshing. And ram said, my brother, the mule, is willing to pull the plow, but when humans yoke him together with stronger and faster animals, it nearly breaks his neck to keep up. God said, I will forbid human beings to yoke to the plow two animals of different species. And Ram said, after all that hard labor, when do working animals ever get a chance to rest? God said, all creatures should rest. I will tell human beings to rest their animals on the Sabbath. Now all the time God was talking to the Ram, God was also keeping watch on Abraham and Isaac. Friends, today's reading reminds us of a long-standing Christian debate. Are we justified by God, by faith, or by works? Martin Luther was convinced that we cannot purchase our way to salvation by our good deeds or through indulgences, Instead, our faith, sprouting from God's very grace alone, is the means to God's salvation. And in a similar vein, John Wesley, a few centuries later, 
claimed that our human faith is a response to God's grace and love, and faith is the response and the means to God's salvation. Yet Wesley would add to that. Wesley taught that great grace-inspired faith cannot lie hidden, but faith will appear by our deeds. We cannot hide our light under a bushel, Jesus said. And Wesley called these deeds the means of mercy. Feeding the hungry, teaching the unlearned, healing the sick, housing the homeless. These means of mercy are signs that we are a faithful people living faithfully in God's grace. And for Wesley, we perform such acts of mercy as a natural response that we have to God's grace in us, in our lives. They are the outward appearance of a faith that dwells within. Wesley's words and thinking are similar to those of the letter James who wrote, I, by my works, will show you my faith. Who wrote, be doers of the word, not merely hearers. And James used the very story of the binding of Isaac as the example of faith, saying, Abraham had faith, and by that faith was justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. In the letter, James does not deny faith. In fact, he wrote that faith produces endurance. He wrote that we should ask everything of God in faith and never doubting. But James was also clear. We will know faith when we see it. Not when someone tells us of faith, but in seeing acts of mercy, seeing the deeds of faith. James wrote, so faith without works is also dead. Beloved, we are like a summer fruit tree. We are like the fruit on that tree, the fruit that was nourished by the soil, the water, the air, and the sunlight. We are the fruit on the vine, the vine of Jesus the Christ. And God's grace nourishes us through Christ. And so lest we rot on that vine and fall worthless to the ground, we are God's fruit, and as God's fruit, we should offer ourselves out of faith to nourish others. That is our Christian identity of faith, to nourish others as God's fruit. And so we respond to God's nourishment by turning to God in prayer. We respond when we meditate on the Word and on God's creation, and we respond to grace by worship and praise, we respond by tending the sheep and feeding the flock. We respond by God's grace by calling our neighbors to boost their spirits or listening with compassion to the struggles of someone unlike ourselves or delivering meals on wheels or protecting our neighbors from harm and by welcoming the stranger into our assembly. James wrote, Faith was active along with Abraham's works, and faith was brought to completion by his works. So completing the story from Genesis, we heard that the angel of the Lord called Abraham, Abraham's calling the third time, and for the third time, Abraham faithfully replied, here I am. And so now all the time God was talking to that ram, God was also keeping watch on Abraham and Isaac. And God said, Ram, you must climb the mountain. Time is running short. Isaac is bound to the altar. And I cannot make rules for every case of animals. But you know I have mercy for all creatures I have made. I will tell all humanity that those who would be righteous must respect the lives of their animals. Satisfied, the ram climbed the mountain. But just short of the top, the ram asked, God, how much longer must we be put to the fire for the sake of your name? God answered, not long. In time, people will honor me more with deeds than with smoke and fire. The sacrifices will stop. But hurry now, Abraham lifts the knife. 
With that, the ram raced headfirst into the thicket. And in that instant, the ram felt the gentle touch of the angel's hand. Beloved, let us go forth this day with faith and honoring God, with faith by our deeds, like the ram, like Abraham. Amen. that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We confess that we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us for the sinful acts we have knowingly and unknowingly committed and empower us to live in harmony with your grace. Amen. Beloved, rejoice in the promise of Jesus our Christ, who makes us dead to sin and alive to God. Therefore, make your heartfelt confession to God, reject evil, attend to goodness, and live with the full assurance that God forgives your sins. Amen. And with the forgiveness of sins, we can know the peace of Christ that comes among us and is offered to us freely from God our Savior in Christ. So I offer you this day words of a blessing of peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Let us pray together our prayers of intercession on this day. For all Christian disciples and ministers, laity and clergy alike, to have their faith renewed in times of change, to be refreshed with the Holy Spirit, and to live with humility and loving kindness, we pray. Lord, have mercy for the people of this congregation to live without anxiety, but rather to live with hope and glad hearts, we pray. Christ, have mercy. For those who suffer from poverty, hatred, thoughtlessness, injustice, and oppression, to be made whole according to their need, 
we pray. Lord, have mercy. For the world, its peoples, and its leaders to know peace through justice and reconciliation and mercy, we pray. Christ, have mercy. And for the joys uplifting our hearts, and for the concerns weighing on our souls, we bring all before you and ask your blessing on each according to your goodness, we pray. Lord, have mercy. So let us pray together, friends, the, with confidence the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, Lord, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, it is with a glad heart that I can continue to share that we are a giving and generous congregation, that we are offering to our neighbors what they have in needs. We continue to offer foods for those who are hungry. We continue to offer our services to those around us. I invite you this week to prayerfully consider making an offering to this congregation that we might continue to uphold our ministries in this community. Let us pray our offertory prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your grace has come alive in our lives and your mercy brings us your peace. As a sign of our thanks, we offer you the first fruits of our labors. May the offering of our labors and the offering of our lives be pleasing to you. In Christ we pray. Amen.
Friends, let us go then this week with a blessing, knowing that Jesus Christ died to defeat sin and death so you might live with faith and glory. Be blessed with God's goodness and the fullness of God's love for you. And may the triune God, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, who creates, redeems, and sustains us, bless you and accompany in your journeys with grace. Amen.